Chrissy and say thanks ever so much for doing this presentation. Thank you very much. I've got a microphone. I don't know if you can hear at the back. Yeah. Is that OK, yeah? yeah. All right, that's cool. Um, sex and gender, sex, stroke gender or sex gender? Is it realistic to sustain the separation of the concepts of sex and gender at a time when diversities of identity and diversities of embodiment not necessarily mapping easily or clearly onto binary concepts of masculinity and femininity are proliferating and being granted recognition. To address this question, uh, I'm going to consider what the nature and basis of, rec of the recognitions being granted are and to what extent they actually overcome discrimination, prejudice and inequality. Further, what is the basis of discrimination itself in the neoliberal environment? Um, this is what we're going to talk about. This is what I'm going to talk about. Contemporary scholarship in the UK has documented the growth of trans visibility and diversity over the past decade or so, and also the proliferation of non-binary identities. Thus, Sally Hines writes that transgender as a concept and as an identity practice, highlights the limitations of binary categorizations of gender and sexuality, and I necessarily include sex here as well, which indicate the problematic of foregrounding either gender or sexuality in social theories of identity construction. In her research, Hines quotes a respondent, Dell, who discussing themselves in terms of a sex, gender, sexuality intersection said that I call myself a hermaphrodite sometimes. I've been a queer dyke. Queer is probably the term I feel best describes me. I could call myself a queer tranny boy. Everything is qualified in one way or another. Heinz, 2007. Similarly, in other research, Heinz, cited by Davey, notes that the Gender Recognition Act is unable to recognise diversity of new trans masculinities and femininities as they're variously constructed and experienced. Equally, discussing non-normative embodiment, and this came up at one of the roundtable discussions yesterday, uh, discussing non-normative embodiment, specifically chest reconstruction, one of my research respondents told me, so as soon as someone has said that it's possible to explore the surgery but not necessarily have the hormones, that was a no-brainer. I thought, I've got to do that. Thus, both in terms of identity and embodiment projects, the proliferation of diversity is becoming well documented. Anne Fausto Sterling notes that in order to shift the politics of the body, one must change the politics of science itself, which might link a little bit to what we just heard. Biologic, biological dimorphic structures, according to which bodies are compelled to be classified as either female or male, were developed in the West in an Enlightenment culture which was already underwritten by binary cultural assumptions, which in turn, its science reflected and reinforced. Following on from this, scientists writing in the post-Kinsey 21st century, such as biologist Fausto Sterling, cognitive neuroscientist Cordelia Fine, and socio-medical scientist Rebecca Jordan Young, for example, are challenging the assumptions of dimorphism. Examining the multiplicities of biological configurations in human somatic sexual differences, and critiquing the concepts of dimorphic brain science, they note that the variety of naturally occurring human sexual configurations and indeed their relative frequency and uh, contextualised by comparison to incidences of albinism, for example, um, mean that efforts to treat non-normative configurations read the purported normativity of human biological ontology incorrectly. The norm is reflected should be reflected in the natural diversity, not in the enforced binary. Equally, each of them challenge brain science, which suggests fixed binary categories of female and male brains, exemplified by Simon Baron-Cohen's asking, 
why, in over a hundred years of the existence of the Field Medal Maths equivalent of the Nobel Prize, have none of the winners ever been a woman? Because female brains can't do maths. <laughs> As Jordan Young notes, sex is not the force that produces these contrasts, it's merely the name of our total impression of the differences. In a multidisciplinary context, she notes that in respect of understanding somatic variety, nature-nurture is indivisible and organisms, human and otherwise, are active processes, moving targets from fertilization until death. So, we can understand the relationship between embodiments and identities as historicized and contingent, but nonetheless meaningful as well. In this context, I note that some transmasculine people I interviewed are reporting a growing rapprochement with their own feminine identities, and other scholarship notes that some trans feminine identified people similarly report engagement with their more masculine aspects. Equally, that other trans and non-trans identified people report more gender neutral or non-binary, non-conforming identities and expressions. It's difficult, therefore, to understand how a meaningful connection between physical sexes in all different varieties can be mapped in a binary way onto gendered identities in all different varieties. The situation is much more complex and interesting for trans and non-trans people alike. I question the border between trans and non-trans. Where, where is the demarcation line? Um, indeed, trans becomes only one possible configuration or manifestation or conceptualization of non-normative identity expression at this historical point, where, in my work, I problematize the very nature of normativity itself. Indeed, I go further and suggest that insisting on maintaining separate binary notions of sex and gender actively reinforces cissexist discourses that contribute to trans and non-binary erasure, discrimination and oppression. I also suggest that although, given the above, it seems necessary to recouple sex and gender as sex gender, that we still need to have a robust account of the grounds on which sex gender erasure, discrimination and oppression take place and therefore to develop an approach which addresses these ongoing problems, the politics. Too many things to hold. Sorry. If we consider ongoing structural oppressions and or discriminations, it seems clear that femininely identified people suffer more oppression or discrimination on the basis of their sex genderedness than masculinely identified people. We can categorize these in terms of paid and unpaid labor, access to positions of power and influence, and the policing and violation of ethical social codes in relation to discourses of embodiment, of femme embodiment, uh, van der Drift, in terms of reproductive and other legal rights and personal safety. And while these discriminations do represent something deeply important, negatively affecting the lives of many people in significant polyvalent material and socio-economic ways, which we need to continue to fight against, what isn't necessarily taken into account of are the ways that sex gender minorities are discriminated against, both similarly and differently in relation to these issues. I also argue, however, that the vectors of discrimination have changed over time and that we need to take account of the changing socio-political environment when we account for and theorize resistance against discrimination. <coughs> in her work on neoliberal pleasure, Winnobst distinguishes the disciplining distinguishes the disciplining creation of interiority that produces identities outlined in the history of sexuality volume one amongst other of Foucault's work emerging out of an earlier liberal focus on contract 
which underwrites a, man, a rights of man ethos from a neoliberal focus on the individual as entrepreneur. So we're moving now. As Winnips tells us, the former is ethical, the latter efficient, and underwrites the shift from the interiority of the autonomous subject that purports to control his or her behaviour to the socially scripted self that seeks to navigate the market's vacillations and thereby maximise his or her interests. Further, when the market begins to function as a site of veridiction, ethical truth-telling, it becomes a kind of social ontology with the causal power to produce competitive, atomistic subjectivities with specifically demarcated sets of values, concerns and interests. This, I contend, is reflected in the proliferation of non-normative sex gender identities and in bodifications, trans or otherwise, in the 21st century, but is also reinforced by the atomizing socio-technological environment which it inhabits and the shape of which it is formed and through which it discourses. Something to do with the internet connected there. At this shift, at a personal level, space is still left for subjectivities based on different understandings of their ontological or perhaps better teleological basis. But socially, the focus moves towards an entrepreneurial engagement with our socio-political environment. Inequality is required as the reification of the market at every level within our socio-polity socio requires competition between individuals. And with competition, we inevitably have winners and losers. People, more or less, socio-economically, successful. But the apparent increase in social diversity is also a marker of our contemporary lives. Contemporary discourses of diversity represent in part a recognition of changing global circumstances with mobile populations and shifting markets of labour and consumption. In order for those same markets to function to maximum potential, this requires the participation of as wide a constituency as possible. It's simply inefficient to exclude people who could otherwise function as fungible participants in terms of their own labour and as consumers in the market on the basis of their ontological, teleological or identity markers. Neoliberal diversity programmes, and let me be quite clear, this includes such devices as the Equality Act, are not about equality. They're about facilitating the most efficient participation in the market by the largest possible number of participants. This explains why normativity is no longer policed and enforced as it was under the regimes of industrial capitalism, winnubst against, winnubst again. Unlike the other discursive fields that Foucault has investigated, the demarcation at work in neoliberalism is not that of normativity, non-normativity. Neoliberal operates through the social rationality of success, not identity. And it is this recognition of the relative lack of the importance of normativity that requires us to consider, to reconsider, the meaning or meanings of the increase of acceptance of diversity in sexuality and sex gender identity and expression. So, the diversities that are permitted within the ambit of neoliberalism are of a particular type. They are purely formal, they must be hollow and stripped of any historical residues. To focus on neoliberal tropes of diversity that affect trans and non-normatively sex-gendered people, this means giving sociological recognition, giving protections around the domains of employment and healthcare, and negotiating sensitivities of conservative constituencies, religious or otherwise, towards marriage, education, and childcare, for example. This doesn't mean, however, that all trans and non-binary people are recognized and protected equally. And the nature and force of the exclusions and discriminations 
entail that in organising politically to overcome these issues, we need to recognise the limits of neoliberal permission and tolerance, and by extension, the limits of what is being achieved in the name of diversity. We also need to recognise the extent to which these recognitions tend to ensure that previously ingrained vectors of whiteness and middle class privilege are reproduced at the expense of still marginalised, non-normatively sex gender constituencies. This can be demonstrated with reference to queer diversity and its depoliticisation. Beatrice Preciado, commenting on this in Testo Junkie, 2013, tells us, the word queer, which was culturally translated and served for several years as a name that referred to various struggles occurring in Anglo-Saxon and European countries, has been subjected today to a growing process of reification and commercialisation. In the past few years, queer has been recodified by the dominant discourses. We are currently facing the risk of turning the term into a description of a neoliberal free market identity that generates new exclusions and hides the specific conditions of the oppression of transsexual, transgender people, crip or racialised bodies. This exemplifies the way in which neoliberalism can capture and colonise discourses which have the potential to destabilise and challenge hegemonic systems, which in turn become trendy, vacuous and safe, and their subjectivities clearly able to operate within the terms of neoliberal entrepreneurship. This is the case in a complicated way with trans as well. Complaints that trans people necessarily enforce patriarchal oppression are not well grounded as the emergence of a more radical trans activism, activism in the 1990s, striker 2008, demonstrates. Recognition of certain kinds of binary trans identities is becoming embedded in law and practice. But is this apparent progress even and shared by all? I've already suggested not. And how does the more recent emergence and foregrounding of non-binary discourses, which are being taken notice of by trans activists, but which are also emerging into the public domain in healthcare and on official forms, for example, impact upon our understanding of what current diversity discourses mean for sex gender and its political efficacy? Three things stand out. Firstly, as in terms of trans activism, the recognitions and protections that have been won or awarded have had both an individual benefit for some trans people and a broader cultural effect in legitimising the identities of trans people in some limited respects. Secondly, a process now seems to be underway to extend these recognitions, at least culturally, although I think widespread legal recognition and protection of non-binary identities seems unlikely in England and Wales in the near future. But also, it's clear that the terms of these recognitions and protections, as currently conceived and constructed along a single vector line of sex gender identity, noting the sex same marriage process, merely narrowly extends privilege rather than granting equality, and in so doing conspires to maintain the marginalization of many people who claim non-normative sex gender identities, trans and non-trans alike. And thirdly, that as discrimination and oppression is still enacted upon people on the basis of a mitigated perception of their sex gender identities and embodiments, again broadly to the greater disadvantage of femininely, femininely sex gendered people, along multiple intersectional ax axes, we need to excavate politics which takes account of this and builds alliances rather than being based on a narrow essentialist sectional identity politics. It is through an analysis of discrimination against femininely identified and or embodied people that we see the weakness of maintaining a sex gender distinction and this illuminates the need to understand the contemporary nature of discrimination and oppression differently and highlights the need to search for new alliances and socio-political approaches.
To develop this briefly, let me suggest a basis for which such a politics might seek to recognise people in relation to specific discriminations, what it needs to take account of, and what, at its broadest and most inclusive, and arguably most radical, its aim should include. Nearly finished. Such a politics needs to take account of discrimination and oppression suffered generally, but as important, as importantly, equally along intersectional axes by differently feminine people, regardless of their assignations at birth, the fixity of their identities, and the legal recognition of their social identities, along lines which should not seek to impose binary markers which distinguish sex and gender. It needs to take account, rather, of the situatedness of individuals within the current socio-political environment and of how the importance that is attached to them and their abilities to respond to expectations of their ability to act as entrepreneurs of the self distorts and relegates the relative importance of their sex gender identities to their ability to engage as producers and consumers of wealth within a neoliberal polity. It should include an acknowledgement that, although an increase in recognition of diverse sex gender identities has, as acknowledged above, genuine and important benefits for non-normatively sex gendered people trans and otherwise identified, the socio-political benefits which have accrued from such recognitions are partial and restricted and further serve to act in a pink-washing way. This obscures the continuation of discrimination against less privileged individuals in terms of their non-binarism or other intersectional aspects such as age, class, disability or ethnicity in relation to the same socio-political benefits as well as issues of embodiment such as suitable and non-discriminatory access to mainstream healthcare, representation in mainstream cultural life or sexist, cis-sexist erasure in terms of everyday social intercourse. If everyday sexism is a thing, and it clearly is, so is everyday cis-sexism. Oh! <laughs> I want to finish with a quote. Yes. Oh, which emphasises my view that merely utilising the tools of the establishment, the tolerance implied in the passing of diversity legislation and binary legal recognition will never be a sufficient corrective to continuing economic and cultural inequality. Audrey Lord, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Thank you very much.